Gig Gab, episode 238, the podcast for working musicians for Monday, December 30th, the last one of the year, 2019. folks and welcome back to the last episode of gig gab for the year here in stormy durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in normal san jose california it's paul kent (laughs) uh we actually enacted our snow day policy today my friend uh there were there were a lot there was a lot more to it than that it wasn't just that there was more than four inches predicted as i mentioned that's that's kind of a the general policy of any band i'm in around here is is we set if there's more more than four inches predicted anybody in the band can cancel the gig without any internal repercussions of course external repercussions are up to whoever you know if a club gets pissed about it well you know so be it right but um but there was a a fundraiser that we were supposed to play this afternoon or this evening uh monday so yeah yeah today the 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 day of the show and um it was we were actually opening it was down at the stone church which is very close to my house uh we were opening for a band of like high school and college kids that we all know it was a fundraiser for one of the teachers at the school he's got this project that he's doing and um you know with the way the snow was like, like i said there were some other factors as well but there was, you know, six to eight inches of snow predicted starting last night through basically tomorrow. And with a band of kids attracting other, you know, and I say kids, these are, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, maybe, well, maybe 16 to 22 year olds. And so, you know, less than seasoned snow drivers and that sort of thing. I just didn't want that on carrying that on my back all day. So mm. we, we, I mean, it wasn't just me that made the call, but I was the one that sort of shined that light. Like, do we really like, we're not saving lives here, except maybe we are. If we cancel the gig like this, how important is this? And it, factoring everything together is like, Oh yeah, yeah. Pull the plug. That's it. We'll do it another time. It's like, great. So yeah, snow day happens. I think it's the first time that we've canceled the gig be- that we've canceled the gig because of snow in a long time. Uh, we've had yeah, gigs canceled. This in your contract? So no, we don't. Um, it, it, you know, contracts are an interesting thing, right? Like that. That's a. It, it, it's been a long time since I've put together a contract. Uh, in Uptown Celebration, we do contracts all the time, and I believe there is a weather clause in in those. Uh, but um, but with like with fling and and you know monkey fist and those sorts of things, it's it's more all done just via email. Yeah. So there's no so there's no contract. But but generally, yeah. And if you know, like in a in a situation like this, it was sort of a uh, I'll call it a self organized fundraiser. It was with this teacher at the school, and uh, but in a in a normal gig situation, if it's three days before, four days before, and there's a significant amount of snow predicted, you usually have an idea that a storm like this is coming. You know, it's not a surprise overnight or something. Yeah. Yeah. And and so there'll be a conversation like, hey, what are you thinking about this? Here's what we're thinking. And, it, it you know, just start kind of having that talk. And, and they'll, you know, club owners don't generally know what their business is like when there's snow, some clubs, I, some of my favorite gigs that I've ever played have been when we're all sort of trapped in a club all night because it's just blizzarding outside shared crisis, shared crisis. Oh yeah. No, I, I definitely have some, some memories. There was this one club near the university of Connecticut, which is sort of in the Northeastern corner of Connecticut, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And, and, you know, we, we go figure was the band that I played in college and we had a, fairly large following so anywhere we played we were able to pack the room and it was this one club we played and they had a wood stove in the club and it i mean it made it hot af but it but it was great you know i mean it was like this really nice vibe and it was this sweaty thing and you just look outside and you just see the snow just like you know feet per hour kind of thing pouring down outside but yeah it was fun Mm. whatever yeah so any idea what that clause looks like what a weather clause like obviously in california you know, yeah. we don't have snow clauses. Um, we do have force majeure, you know, like mm. acts of God, God 
clauses, that type of thing. But yeah. what would a what would a weather clause look like for a contract? I, though, if I were to draw it up, I would say that look, you know, if there's more than four inches predicted, four inches, you yeah. would actually be speci- that specific. Well, that's the that's the metric we use internally in our band. So why not? you know, make it the same externally. Right. And if there's more than four inches predicted, either party has the right to cancel the, uh, the, the gig, you know, with no financial impact to the other, uh, you know, and, and put a time limit in like it, you know, you got to cancel six hours before downbeat or, you know, something like that, or, or maybe even yeah. 24 hours before downbeat. Cause you should certainly be able to do that. Um, rarely is it that one inch is predicted and suddenly you get a foot. If, if, if the forecast is wrong around here anyway, with snow, it's usually that we're going to have two feet and then you wind up with two inches sometimes because the, you know, the storm just kind of changes tact, but, yeah. um, but you know, if there's a big one coming for sure, it's just sometimes if the temp is on the, you know, on the border of freezing, it might just be a rainstorm and that's very different from a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah. Know? Out here, you know, earthquakes and that's an act of God. And you know, that's, yeah. there's way bigger problems than getting to a gig with Correct. an earthquake. Well, and that's that, the thing that. with the snow too. It, it, this was all born out of one gig where we all knew we should not have left the house at 5 PM for whatever, an 8 PM gig. It was yeah, just yeah. no question. And we did it anyway. And then we drove home in two feet of snow. And it was like, when we got home, it was like, okay, let's, ha- let's have a talk. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Did anybody like we were all going because we felt like we didn't want to let the other guys down, y- you know, and that's, that's a good thing to have in a band, yeah. but, yep. but there needs to be a platform for that conversation to happen sort of openly. And that's, that's where that, that policy came from. So, yeah. Um, so I did, uh, Rocky Horror. In fact, I'm doing it again tomorrow night. So we did our our standard Rocky Horror on Christmas night at midnight. So Christmas night at 11:59 p.m. So as not to confuse it with the night before, and and then we're doing it again uh, on New Year's Eve. So the the 31st at at 11:59 p.m. If you will, uh, and we've done this for the last few years, and it's become mostly you know we we've got it down. Most of the same actors are involved. Most of the same musicians. The only change is uh, band wise is we have a different guitar player this year, but keyboard player who's also the music director, my friend Julius, Brad, our bass player. Oh, and we added a sax player as well. But, you know, the core of the band was the same. And when the email came out from Julius, I don't know, two weeks ago or something, it was, hey, you know, we've turned this into a rock show, like a full on rock show. Let's um, I forget how he said it, but but the goal was. Let's add some dynamics to it. Let's 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 play it more like the the Broadway, you know, and or or Paris or I guess it was Paris where it started. No, it was, it was in London. Right. Um, play it like the London run, you know, where it's a little more 70s ish. And so we played. Thankfully, we had two rehearsals. We played the first rehearsal and everybody was trying to play quieter, but it didn't really matter. It was still this like same as it ever was. Right rock sort of mushy kind of thing. It was good, but it, it wasn't any different. It, you know, if it were quieter or a little louder, like it didn't really matter. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. You know, here's a thing. And this, this totally applies. I, I've, I've been through this in, in, you know, cover bands too, where, you know, you wind up learning a song initially based on the recording. And then eventually it just becomes yours, right? You just play it the way you play it. And you stop thinking about the way you play it. Oftentimes it just gets on autopilot. It's like, oh, yeah, we've been playing that song for whatever, five years, 10 years, sometimes. Great. Good to go. And that's that's what happened with these songs in Rocky. And, you know, the songs aren't all that different from each other in Rocky either. So everything just becomes the Rocky song at the Rocky dynamic at the Rocky tempo, you know, and it's just all the way through. So I started really dissecting it like, okay, what can I do differently? I tried some things, but. It didn't matter. You know, we're all just doing the same thing. And it was like, okay, we're all just driving that eighth note, you know, and I really started to dissect it. I wrote wrote a big, long email. It was mostly for my own edification, though. I did share it with the guys. I was like, okay, how do we do this? And it was really a, 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 it was a difficult exercise to go through because it's like, well, this is the way I've always played it. And so I know that this works. Now we're talking about the unknown, right? You know, we might try something that doesn't work. And so 
we had a conversation about it when we got to the second rehearsal, which was the night of the gig. So we get there at 8 p.m. on Christmas night. We have a, a rehearsal that starts at about nine. We play till 1030 because it's a you know pretty short show. Then we you know have dinner and get dressed and, and do the show. So we talked about it a little bit before that nine o'clock rehearsal. And it was like, yeah, what can we do differently? And, and we all had like some specific ideas for each other, which is great because sometimes it's hard to see the forest from the trees. And, and one thing Julius suggested to me was it's like, yeah, everything you said in your email was right. He's like, it's difficult to, to know, like without having four rehearsals to break down every section of every song and say like, OK, here's what we could do here. Maybe less instrumentation here. No drums, no guitar, whatever, you know, Um he was like, watch how much you're washing the hi-hat. And he says, keep the hi-hat tight. It's like, ah, right. Yeah, okay, good. And that certainly helped. But, but what we realized in talking about it was that it wasn't that we had to make less noise in order to make this thing the, the way we wanted and add more dynamics. It was the ha- we had to make less noises. And it, it really meant, like, instead of playing eighth notes in some parts, play quarters. You know, like literally making less noises and and mm-hmm. th- not playing, not necessarily playing quieter, but less dense. Playing less, yeah, yeah. And it was a more really space. more space, yeah. And so we did the the run that way. After having that conversation, it all sort of like percolated and was like, oh, that's the answer. Okay, and we did it. And it was obvious that we were doing it and we were really actually having fun doing it. You know, working off of each other and and trying to play less off of each other and that sort of thing. And we got to the end of the rehearsal. It was like, that's awesome. It's like, uh uh-oh, wait a minute. It's awesome to us. Like, Mm -hmm. um, is it awesome because it's a novelty or is it awesome because it's awesome? You know, (laughs) so we had to ask the director uh, who was in the house and and someone we trust, obviously, like, okay, what did you think of that? You know, he's like, no, that really made a difference. He's like, there was there were places to go with the songs. It was like, yeah, right. So, okay, so we did it that way. And and. I, I certainly don't think this is the only reason for it, but uh, I think everybody delivered. In fact, I know everybody delivered actors, cast, crew alike, uh, but it was the best performance of Rocky we've ever done. So we're totally screwed for tomorrow night, but that's uh, right. <laughs> but it was just interesting to, you know, to to sort of, you know, rehash this thing that was already in the bag. So, yeah. You know, I think that's I think about the songs that we have. Actually, let let me even back up a little further. I think about. I always get a kick out of when an artist reimagines their own stuff. Right. Yes. And and finding new interpretations, new feels, new breaks, new, you know, harmonies, whatever it might be. It's always interesting to me. And I, I think that as cover bands, we tend to learn and move on. Right. We tend right. to like get it, get it in the bag. And, you know, that one's done. People will like it. Let's move on. But there I think that there's a lot of great collaborative experience and experimentation that can happen. That's good for a band to learn to speak common musical language, learn what what a band's strengths are by you know common problem solving like that. Yeah. Or, yeah. or just lo- just looking for the weird. I mean, I, I that was one thing when I was taking vocal lessons. Uh, the last teacher that I was taking with was really an interesting guy, very bohemian. Um, and he was like, you know, into different techniques and all this stuff. So he goes, he goes, you're kind of looking for the weird. You're kind of looking for not the thing you expect. You know, you want to place notes in different places in your resonance. You want to you want to go out and look for weird. It may sound weird, but sit with that weird for a while yeah. and see how it works. You yeah, know, d- different you, is only different the first time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I, I think I'm, I'm a big fan of that. You know, just you have to be careful, stuff. though, as, as I pointed out to the guys, you know, uh, Clapton's acoustic version of Layla was only good because we knew the electric version. If the acoustic version of Layla was the only one we'd ever heard, we never would have heard it. Right. So like. The, well, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. <laughs> so. um <laughs> Uh, that that's that's a causation thing. So so obviously Layla is a classic yeah. and and it frames our understanding of it. I think actually think the acoustic one is quite interesting. There might not have been the right way to deliver that acoustic one, but it's beautiful playing. It is. Right? So, but it, but so, it was good like once it, it it's not nearly as strong as the original. 
It would, the it original does, is is an all time classic. Correct. Song. I will I will give you that. But um, I I don't know I, if you're an acoustic player and you want to play Layla, that's a pretty definitive model for how to play Layla acoustically. You it get is. the benefit of it that everybody knows it, and that's actually a little bit of what I'm saying is that yeah, yes, you do have to be careful with it. Not all change is good change. Change for the sake of change is not good. You have to improve upon it or at least make it interesting. Correct. Right. And you and you have to be discerning enough to decide whether you're being clever for clever's sake or whether you're adding something to the art. That's exactly it. That's right. You, you, and, and it's hard to have that perspective. In some cases, it might even be impossible for you as the artist to have that perspective. But but that's but you have to have it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I will say I did stumble onto one other really important thing uh, for Rocky Horror. The band is on stage. And so I asked um, Brandon, our director, I was like, all right, well, you know, what do you want the band? And he's like, any, you, you said looking for the weird, that's almost verbatim what his text back to me was. It was like it, whatever you wear, it must not be oh, normal. Clothing. Yes. Right. You need to be, you can't be stark naked. Right. But it must be weird, you know, oh, like, gosh. like ridiculous. He didn't say weird. He said the, the more ridiculous, the better, you know, and go with the Christmas theme. And so I thought, well, I have wow. a Christmas onesie that Lisa got for the whole family three or four years ago. And I had forgotten about it. But thankfully, Facebook, you know, does those those remember four years ago or whatever. And it was like, oh, crap, I have that in the closet. So I wore a onesie while I played. Now, this is a onesie with feet and a hood. So I was a little concerned about heat um, being a, an issue, you know, playing for an hour and, and a you half. You like your bare feet out there. Well, I'm I'm okay in socks. I've I've certainly played in socks, and this had grips on the feet, so that part was fine. But um, but I was a little worried, so I wore a shirt underneath it, thinking, okay, if I need to take it off, that like at least I have a t-shirt or whatever. And I brought pinking shears on stage with me in case I needed to make alterations, like taking the feet off mid-show. Um, it turns out the shirt was the only bad decision I made. I wound up taking off the shirt in the middle and then just rezipping the uh, the onesie. And it was, I mean, it was warm, but the thing about wearing the onesie, Paul, when I play the drums, as, as with many drummers, most in fact, I'm sitting down and having something like tight around my waistband, like even, you know, the waistband of my pants or having a belt or anything like that is all, not always, but often is, you know, a weird pressure point. Like it, it, it does restrict motion in a way. Well, with the onesie, there was no such problem. I was free and I liked Please it. Please tell me you were not. <laughs> this was not a commando situation. Please tell me. Uh, I will tell you this was not a commando situation. No, it was That's not a commando situation. We could end situation. it right there. That's, we could end it right there. But I may or may not have another different onesie <laughs> to wear tomorrow night to continue to explore this particular uh, vibe. So yeah. explore the space, man. The vre- the freedom of the onesie, man. It's <laughs> it's crazy. I, I I never thought about how. I mean, it was like playing naked. I mean, it was just except without the risk of you know what happens potentially with a drummer if you play naked. I'm, I'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah. So we have um we have a couple of topics to go through. We have um an email from Tom about democracy and song selection. I have another thing about money to talk about. It may or may, we may or may not get to today. And then, and then before we wrap up, we want to do our musical new year's resolutions. But the first thing or next thing that I want to do is talk about our sponsor, which is circle home. Plus listen, you're musicians, right? That means you're creative, smart, and adventurous, and you've done some crazy things. You're always looking for the weird, as you say, you know? Well, your kids are probably doing the same thing. But if they're using those gifts to get on parts of the internet that you want to keep off limits, Circle can help. You know, if you want to make sure your kids aren't watching another YouTube video at 2 a.m. instead of, say, going to sleep, Circle can make sure your kids get a distraction-free night's sleep. And you know how important that is. What Circle does is it's the Circle Home Plus. It's a device that you plug into your router, then you download the app onto your phone, and you can keep track across every connected device, laptops, phones, tablets, smart TVs, Xboxes, you know, all all the video game consoles, streaming devices, all from one place. 
And as the parent, you can filter what content is allowed. You can set limits for screen time across groups of devices for each user. You can monitor history and usage. You can even reward your kids for good behavior. And because you are a GigGab listener, you get a limited time offer of $30 off a Circle Home Plus when you visit meetcircle.com slash giggab and enter giggab at checkout. So that's $30 off when you visit meetcircle.com, M-E-E-T-C-I-R-C-L-E dot com slash giggab, coupon code giggab at checkout. One more time, that's meetcircle.com slash giggab with giggab at checkout to save $30 and our thanks to Circle. And Circle Home Plus for being a sponsor. Thanks, yeah. So I played two gigs, Paul, and with two different bands. And I'm, I'm going to try and protect the innocent here, although if, if people are listening, I mean, I've had these conversations with these folks, but I'll, I'll leave it out so that only the folks who know know. Um, where I was not the one who booked the gig, right? It, somebody else books the gig, which happens more often than not, right? I, we've talked about that. I don't tend to book gigs. You know, I don't go out of my way to book gigs. I, I happily play the gigs other people book. There is a responsibility, though, that falls on the person that's booking the gig. That may be the band leader or it may just be the person that's booking the gig. And, you know, you might, like we do in Fling, you know, distribute, um, you know, the responsibilities around. But whoever's booking the gig needs to understand that yes they need to know and have agreement from their bandmates about what is acceptable really in terms of everything but specifically for this conversation in terms of money uh playing gigs is fun but not getting paid causes all not getting paid appropriately causes all kinds of problems uh for not just you and your band but other musicians, too, where you're setting the bar to a point where, you know, other folks, maybe your band doesn't need the money. Maybe you're, you know, all, uh, you know, cat, your cash flow and your band comes from somewhere else. We've talked about this on the show. That's irrelevant. It, you need to make sure that you're getting what your band is worth. Uh, and, and so I played these two gigs. One was they were both well attended, that we had fun at both of them. We played well, and at one, um, I think I made like $42, and at the other, I think I made 115 And it's not hard to ask for more money. In fact, at the one where I made more, we had been getting paid less at this place, and the person who books the gigs went up to the person who at the club who coordinates everything when we booked, you know, this next round of, of shows and said, Hey, you know, here's the deal. Here's how many people I'm bringing. Uh, I need to get per each person at least X. And so we need to raise it. Um, and it was probably, we need to raise it, you know, 35% over what, we were previously being paid and we had already proven our value. They wanted us back. You know, it's a, it's been an ongoing thing. And it, the, the person was like, yep, I totally get it. Thanks for bringing it to me. It consider it done. And it was done. There was no problem. You know, everything went good. The fear of losing the gig when you ask for what's fair is something we all need to get over and we need to help each other get over and so as the, you know, as the side man in a band, I will never be, I mean, I might be uh, disappointed to lose a gig that that's fine, but I would never take it out on the booker or the band leader. If that person went to bat for all of us and said, Hey, look, we can't play there if we're not getting, you know, this fair wage. You know, right. and, you know, and if the person that books the gig says no, well, OK, then then we won't play there. Right. You, you know, you got to kind of you, what, once you open that door, you have to you have to live with the consequences of it. But uh, so do so do the people on the other side of it. So, so I have a lot to share about this. And I'll yeah. actually start with the last thing you said is that that I know in my band, no one in my band would ever give me a hard time for turning down a gig or walking away from a gig um, where there wasn't a reasonable discussion about, about compensation. So yeah. Yeah. that I, I believe my band and I are, are lock in lockstep on that. You know, Dave, I always think 
that one of the most interesting things that we offer the world in this podcast is like you as kind of the musician side man with some, you know, experience in leading or owning a band sure. and me really more from that leadership perspective. And um, I think that that give and take is really good and healthy. I know I learn a lot from your perspectives and I've Same. certainly yeah. changed, changed my views on some things for those, for those types of things. I actually, well, with regards to money, I have, I, we could talk about this for about 95 shows, but let, let's just stick with money for right now. So yeah, yeah, it's right. That's why I sort of compartmentalized myself even coming yes. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, we, I had a moment at time in the band where there was grumblings about money, right? There was, you know, and I'll remind you that X amount of guys in my band, over half, their full-time employment is music. They sure. teach during the day and they gig at night, you know, and that's how they earn a living. Right. Yeah. And, and it's over half the guys in the band. And then a couple of the guys in the band have day jobs, you know, and are, are a little bit more flexible and, you know, their, their bar for what is a good gig or what is not as good, good gig. But we got to a point where, where um, I was pushed on, setting some bars for, for what we should be asking. And so I came up, we had a band meeting and, you know, you and I have talked about the, the perils of band meetings and that you typically get, you know, some guys aren't going to speak up, some guys are, and you end up having, you know, directed conversations with fewer guys. Um, But I, I proposed this, I said, listen, it's not practical for me to every gig that comes in, ask the band, will you take it? I'm assuming if you want to be in this band, you want to play. And so let's just put some structure around gigs. And so I said, within 50 miles of the, my hometown, which was close enough for everybody's hometown, within 50 miles of where we live, a hundred bucks is the minimum. You know, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to say this gig is booked and we're going to do it. Sure. hundred bucks um, per person. Per person. Yeah. Just wanted to, I just, it, just for the, yeah, just yeah. for the sake of the uh, audience. Yeah. Or, wanted or to $42 make sure. that needs to be cleared. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, 50 to a hundred dollars, uh, excuse me, 50 to a hundred miles away, 200 bucks is the minimum. Yep. And then over 200, you know, we talk about it. Sure. And, um, you know, in general that, you know, because what I wanted was some structure because it's just not practical for me to have to have give and take with nine, well, 10 other people in order to get consensus on a, on a, you know, it just, that would be ridiculous amount of work. Yep. So, there are. And then when it comes to charity gigs, I ask, I don't tell. Right. Yep. I say, hey, we've been offered the opportunity to do this. I think it's a good thing. You know, and, and really what we probably should have is some agreement that uh, we will uh, take three to four charity gigs a year. Right. You know, so, some number, whatever the number may be that, you know, we are in to donate our time. And I certainly have had. Uh, musicians who have declined doing charity gigs in the past saying, I don't give away my services. Yeah. You know, the people had a hard line about that. You know, and and there's something to be said for that. For for the next time you hear a musician say that it, for those of us that happily give away our time to charity gigs and, and I've never, it it wasn't until I had this perspective, I'm going to share that, that I ever even understood the other side of it. But the question to ask is, is the caterer bringing all the food for free and are they offering their time for free? That's a big question. That's a great question to help set your own internal barometer or perhaps someone else's internal barometer. And the answer usually is no, no. but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take the gig. No. And if it's a cause you feel you yes. know is worthy, you want to contribute something, you have something in your quote unquote time budget for how much time you want to spend supporting good causes. Yep. I think that's a good use of I personally, and I, and I think I speak for my band, um, feel that's a good use of time if it's the right thing. And, you know, the, the types of things that the guys will push back on something like that is, you know, are they making us park a mile away? Do they right. feed us? You know, are, are they, are there some respect and gratitude for the amount of time that, you know, that we're contributing? So yes. no, all these a, things that's are a great. Those are great questions to ask for those. You know, I always say free gigs, not charity gigs, but just free gigs where people or, you know, $12 and nachos as my favorite line goes. Often <laughs> when someone offers you $12 and nachos, the problem is not the twelve dollars and nachos, but it is a a barometer that tells you they don't know how to make money doing this, and they're probably not going to treat you all that well while you are doing it. And Absolutely. so that you know that that's a good barometer. With charity gigs, you've already sort of like 
you've given away the 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 money side of it. So you need to not just assume and ask about all the other things to make sure that they know what they're doing. It's going to be a well-organized event. You're not showing up and having to lead the charge for everything because nobody else think, knows what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Yep. You could almost extract this whole conversation to, you, you know, music is an interesting thing that from a business perspective, I'm not going to say from a chops perspective, but from a business perspective in the world of being a musician, you have everything from rank absolute amateurs yeah. to rank total professionals, right? You know, and I had this exchange of, of musical services for whatever value that there is, whether it's money or whether it's goodwill or whatever it is, you said, you know, we all have to keep the bar held and, you know, ask reasonable money, all types of things. And I, and I totally agree with all that. And you and I are lockstep on that. Yeah. Sometimes an, a leader will say, this is a good situation from us. So we might, we should adjust our scale, you know, and, you know, if you're in a band, hopefully you've bought into the leader's vision and he's delivering the goods for you as a leader that, you know, you'll want to seriously think about, you know, if a leader is going to bring this to us. I fully get that I can't get free time, unlimited free time, even if it's something that I would do. So I have to be judicious in how I ask for it. But, you know, if there's a club opening, is it is it a good idea to cut your scale on a one-time basis. Yeah. I just, I just booked a gig where it was actually kind of interesting. Um, I actually, the, the offer came in, I thought it was a corporate gig. It was, you know, someone said, you know, I've spoken to you before about playing for us. What is your scale? And I quoted our corporate scale and they came back and said, well, I can do a little bit less than that. Turns out it was a civic concert series <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it, it's going to be the, one of the best paying civic concert series we've ever done. But she came and so she said yes. And once I figured out what it was, I was like, whoa, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, a and then I quoted the guys and everybody was like, cool. And then she came back to me and she goes, you know what? Um, I've made a mistake. You know, I have a fixed budget. We really want you guys and it would be great. So I actually canceled several other weeks wow. to save the budget to pay you guys. And I got my hand slapped for this by our board of directors. And so I need to come back to you and ask if you can take a little bit less. And that's um, tough because it's because you would have taken what she wants to offer you in the beginning had she offered yeah. it the right way. Yeah. 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 So it's still an excellent paying gig. I went back to the guys and just told them honestly what happened. Yeah. It's still an excellent paying gig. And that she has instead of canceling four other weeks, she's canceling three other weeks. Still says a lot about a commitment to us. But, you know, just as a rule of negotiation, you never give anything without trying to get something. Right. 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 So I said, you know what, I can do this, but I'd like a commitment that you'll book for the same fee next year yeah. right now. And she said, yeah, I'll do that. You know, wow. we, we're until you guys want you. So, you know, I got something. I could go back to the band and say, Hey, I got something. And um, that's huge. Being able to go, you know, for those of you slash us that are out there doing these things, when you're in that kind of scenario, it's like, okay, here's the deal. I've done it where if somebody's opening a new club or there's some, like you said, some scenario where you feel like, you know, if I give this person a chance here to, to, to experiment with us, this might really work. If you believe in that, sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, Hey, you know, we'll do, we'll do three gigs, you know, book three. And the third one is free. Right. So that that gets them in, invested. All sorts of ways to be creative. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Just, to, you know, think about those sorts of things. You don't if they if they say, well, if you come in and play half price, it's like, well, you know what? I'd rather play for free the third time. You know, now it's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, OK. Right. Yep. You know, so but you started your conversation by saying that there's certain expectations of you know not being able to ask for fair money yeah. and that you yeah. you as a side man are investing a certain amount of trust in your leader to go out and represent our time my time yep. in a reasonable way i'm with you i'm on your team i've i've opted into this and i'm in if i did, if i wasn't i'd be gone but you know there's a certain transference here right being in your band means you're going to be respectful of my time and you're going to go out, always try and cut the best deal that you can for us. So if it's going to be less, and again, I got to the point where it seemed to me the right thing to do was to get tacit understanding based upon geography, 50 miles out around, not 50 even miles, tacit, like explicit understanding. Explicit. Yeah. 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 Within 50 miles, 
you know, if I can get this per man, it's not a discussion. If I can get, you know, within a hundred miles, if I can get this, it's not a discussion. I'm just booking it. If it's not to this scale, I will have a discussion with you guys about that. And that, you know, helped, you know, it didn't, didn't totally satisfy everything. And again, that's why these band discussions are exercises in futility often because they all, you know, often take a left turn and, and get into other dissatisfactions about things. Or, you know, I find that some guys, in these environments get their dander up and feel it's an opportunity to show how great a negotiator they are and yeah. you know, momentarily setting aside that we're on the same team. Right. But it becomes a me versus you thing. No, that I- there is that temptation. I like, you know, at, 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 in this particular scenario that I'm talking about, it's like, I, I want my, my instinct is to say, all right, step out of the way. Let me handle this. I'll do it. But it's like, you know, I, I don't really want, I, I I like my role as the side man, but you know, I, in a sense, I want my cake and eat it too. But if you're going to be the one that's coordinating a band and choosing whose plays and all that stuff, it is kind of, it is kind of on you to like, there is that responsibility or your musicians know that these are, you know, effectively unpaid gigs and it's just for fun. And if you've got time, come on out. But it, you know, it, it, there is a, 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 a quid pro quo for lack of a better term, right? If, if, if you are the leader and you are not representing your band's full worth, at least according to the internal consensus of your band, don't be necessary. Don't necessarily expect that people won't bail if something better comes along. Right. Like there's, there's a, there there's, but I hate to do that. Like I, I cannot bring myself to cancel on someone just because a gig for more money came in, you know, elsewhere or even fair money came in elsewhere. If I agreed to do the gig, I'm going to do it. It's just how I am. And it keeps me working. Right. I mean, that, that's a it's how I am. But I'm. it's also a little self-serving because I like. So you bring up like the magic conversation and that everybody has leverage in all these conversations. You Correct. as a side man can walk and go. Yep. Me as a leader, I can replace you. Right. Totally. This is an at will relationship. It is not an employment situation. It is a we're all trying to make things the best for everywhere they can be. Mm-hmm. Some musicians are just happy to be in a band and have someone take care of all the work. And they literally just, you know, you know, I, I, I have done my best job to figure out if this guy is going to book as much as I want to play, whether it's once a month or 10 times a month, or whatever it is. And, you know, I show up, I collect my, and I really don't care about the and band drama or band, you know, sure. p- politics or anything like that. Other people, you know, part of their creative process is weighing in on, you know, on all things that happen to the band. If my if I'm lending my talents to it, it's a representation of me. And damn right, I'm going to speak up, you know, if something is going to affect my brand. And, you know, so these are these are dicey propositions. Right. You know, good leaders. And I come to think of myself lately as a as a pretty good leader. Right. I, I mean, there are there are times when I would think that I should have a hundred percent of the heart and mind of the guys in the band. And when I don't, I own the responsibility that something must be going on, that the transaction is not as pure as I think, you know, that the exchange of my time and my direction and, you know, what I put into it gets, un- and it, it, it is probably a, a shortcoming on mine that I expect it to be unconditional. Right. But there's always conditions. That's there's always conditions. Nature. That's the thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, no, it, it's tough, though. <laughs> like, I I wish everyone it, it it is easier when everyone involved just understands internally understands that hundred dollar a man minimum value or whatever the, the correct minimum value is for your band in your market. Right. And, and like I said, when I was playing in Austin, it was fifty dollars a man. It was just how it was. You know, OK, fine. That's that's the market. This is how it goes. Great. And remember, one the minimum is just one point of the spectrum. Correct. There's also the, there's also like how how much is your leader fighting for your maximum, right? Mm-hmm. How much is you're right? So if you have a leader who's just taking any offer that comes in, and I will say I was guilty of that at a time. Sure. And then my band pushed me. You know, we have paid our dues. We have done our thing. Go out and get more. Yep. And a light bulb went on for me and I felt much more encouraged. I also didn't want to lose guys. And so I had to get out of my comfort zone. So, you know, this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago where we hit this point and I had to get out of my comfort zone and say, listen, 
these guys want to make a living. You know, are we, we're, who are we? You know, we've put in all this time. Yeah. Are we ready to go and ask for more money? And, you know, I would say the thing that you said that I would never lose a band member for turning down a gig that didn't pay well. So that's definitely not one of the problems. Um, you know, that's, you know, that we're all on the same page about that. And in fact, my band has thanked me for walking away from gigs where the negotiations didn't go the way that they should have. They're like, yep. yeah, you know, yeah, I'd love that's to play. Okay. I, I think that's okay. I think the problem comes where there's, um, and I've run into this in a, in a couple of different scenarios where the, the person doing the booking, I don't necessarily want to say the band leader, but of course, sometimes that's who it is that's doing the booking, but the person doing the booking I, not only lacks negotiation skills, but sh but more important than that, lacks the confidence of being able to hear that someone says no. Like, well, I would say it's the other way. The gig, would, let me right? let me massage that a little bit. OK, I think to inexperienced negotiators, the win is getting the booking, not yes. getting the best booking. Right. Right. The, the right. accomplishment that's is that's guys. Right. I got us a gig. Right. Exactly. Not, I got us the best gig at the best price that I can get us. Yes, that's right. No, you're right. It's the same thing. Yeah, it is. It's just inexperienced negotiation. Well, and and lack of confidence. Confidence. Yeah. Just lack of confidence. Yep. Yeah. It's OK to to say no and and not get the gig. It, it's OK not to play if it's the wrong scenario. And that's how I've always justified it in my own head. It's like, OK, well, here's. What do I know is my minimum? And, and if it's just me, well, then it's just up to me. And if it's if I'm representing, you know, a, a band or a podcaster or a website publisher or whatever, it's like, OK, let's talk. What's your minimum? OK, now I, I have the confidence to say no when somebody offers me less than the thing that we all just talked about was our minimum. No problem. I'll say no. No, all good. I, you know, cause I have the backing of whoever I need the backing from that. That's right. the, that's where it is. Um, it, that, but that I realized in saying it, that it is not nearly as simple to get your head to that point as I've just explained it. Logically, it makes sense, but there's the emotional element of, but I want to play. I want, you know, I don't want to, I don't want someone to say no to me. Right. Like that's the entrepreneur's curse is, is you, you know, you're always worried that the, 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 this phone call was the last time it'll ever ring. Right. So you better take right, that game. Right. right? You, you know, it's rarely is that true, especially if you're good at what you do. It, it's just not going to be true, but that is the entrepreneur's curse. And most business, most musicians, whether they want, especially band leaders or, or bookers, uh, are entrepreneurs, whether they want to, you know, there, there is that level of entrepreneurship that's happening. You are representing yourself and then going in and running your business, i.e. playing your songs and entertaining your crowds. So I would know. also add that there's um there's a little bit of gray in this conversation, right? So there's a bit to where the guy will assume it's the band leader, but the booking person or the band leader and the band leader um, has a few to several subjective things going on when engaged in the booking process. Some is investing in a longer term, betting on a longer term relationship and multiple gigs. Some Absolutely. Of it is, yep. You know, some of it is, you know, quite frankly, you know, like I've had band guys say, well, you could have got us free parking also. And I'm like, you know what, for me, I got us a good gig for me to go back and get another, uh, get, get another, you know, $10 a man. I, I'm just not going to use my time or, or my karma points yeah. to go and try and push for that much more. And so, you know, again, to that degree, if you're that guy in a band who, if you're being treated fairly in all other ways and there's good communication, if you are that guy who's like, well, why didn't you get more all the time? You better freaking look in the mirror and realize, <laughs> you know, what kind of a cancer that can put on things. Oh, and, and that's, so, that's the right term to use that when, when that sort of, you know, um, uh, disagreement or that friction happens inside a band. If it's allowed to fester it, it like cancer is the right term. It, it, it really can go the wrong way and it can, it can be the thing that shuts your band down for good. And that's, that's probably not what you want. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, be cool in all, in all situations, whether you're the leader communicate well, if you're the band member, 
you know, you can ask questions, but again, if you're, if you're assuming like you started this, like asking for fair money, right? Yeah, right. That sounds to me like there's an implication that, that you got treated unfairly, right? You're going to go back and say, please go back and be fair on my behalf. Yes. And if, if that's a one-off thing, then it's probably handleable. But if you're in a constant state of feeling as though you're being treated unfairly, you, you might have the wrong situation. That's true. That that is extremely correct. That's right. Yeah, it might just be the wrong. Yeah, if you're finding if it, well, as with anything, if if there's a pattern that develops, especially after conversations have happened or whatever, then it's like okay, well, you know, just like you and I'm I'm speaking as me as the side man, just like I'm encouraging my band booker to go get us a fair gig. Well, if I don't feel that that's happening. I can have that conversation with the band booker and sometimes the result is okay. No, you know, that's, we, we have a different definition of the value here and that's okay. We just don't have to play together like that. That's our fine. best club, our best club. We, um, I knew it was going to be a good club for us. And the guy originally offered us the door. Oh, excuse me. Offered us pretty low pay. Okay. And I said, how about, how about if we play for the door, you don't have to have any risk at all. Sure. And I think I've talked about this before yeah. is that we've gotten quite successful there. And I think the club might be a little bitter that we do so well and he doesn't get a part of the door anymore, but you know, we, our deals hey, are deal the deal. On. Right. Yeah. Right. So there's a new club we're going to try this year. So we've had some changes in the clubs that we play. And again, just to remind everybody, our general business model is we play clubs from January to about May um, and whatever privates come along, but we play sure. clubs. So, you know, polish our new material, keep playing, keep, you know, keep as sharp as we possibly can keep our name out there. You know, it's, it's advertising to some degree when we play the the club dates. Yep. Um, and, and then we don't really do club dates in the summertime when we get real busy with the festivals and concert series and all type of stuff. But anyway, we're going to, we've had a couple, <clears throat> we've had a couple of clubs, um, change over on us or for whatever reason, we're not going to do them or they're not going to do us. Sure. And so we're replacing them. So we're going to start with a new club and um, he's a new club. And uh, uh, I was able to negotiate a hundred a man, including our sound guy. Right. That's great. So, so it's a little bit more than he wanted to pay. It's a lot less than we make in our really good club. And so the question comes up, why, well, why didn't you just do the door thing? Well, a, Remember, we don't have a draw down at this new club yet. So be prepared for that if you want to walk away with 20 bucks or 40 bucks uh, by making that you know suggestion. Um, but this is fair to everybody. This is a good deal. It's not it's not the same as the other situation. But, you know, I went out and did the best I could for this. It's booked. We get to play. You get the minimum that we agreed to. Right. Yeah. Not, right. Not right. the maximum. Yep. And I, I, I also think that that's a you know, I've had guys scream at me. I know what I'm worth. Right. And so go get it. Like, exactly, I mean, that, that, exactly. No, I mean, like that's that's the conversation. That's the flip side of the conversation I was talking about. If I'm not happy with the amount that I'm getting for a gig and it's based on what the I mean, it's like it could be that I'm getting forty two dollars and the person booking the gig for, you know, a four four person band is is getting a thousand and I'm just the one getting screwed. That's one scenario. But but if it's that, you know, I'm getting forty two dollars because, you know, forty two times four is all the band was paid or whatever it works out to be. Well, you know, I can walk away like I can go somewhere else. And that's the, if you don't if you know what you're worth, go get it. Go get it. <laughs> that's it. It's that simple. Yeah. Good conversation. It's tough, though. Yeah, it, it is tough. And, and it's, you know, it's not, well, like any business relationship, there's the human element involved. And that I find especially true when I need to spend, you know, three hours on stage with all these people. You want that part of the reason I leave the house. Sure. It's the hundred bucks or maybe the more than hundred bucks. Right. But uh, the other part is that I enjoy it. and playing just simply playing my instruments yes i enjoy that for sure but playing my instruments with other people is really where the enjoyment comes in well and the flip side of that is if you don't enjoy the other people it's not a good experience bingo it's, it's a miserable experience i had i had a, a gig when i first came up here uh i played with this band and things were going really well and then the um, there was sort of a i don't know somebody left and brought in a different member or whatever and I didn't like he, like I liked all the people that were involved, but the way one of these new people played, 
I hated. I just couldn't deal with it. It was this bass player. No one's going to know who, who this person was, so it doesn't matter. And I found myself getting to the gigs doing two things. I would get there and uh, I would arrange my monitor mix so that I could hear the, the bass the least so that hopefully I didn't have to hear it. And then secondly, I'd go get an extra drink at the bar before we played. And after doing this two or three times, I thought, wait a minute, I'm, I'm somebody that's really, I try to be, I, I come from a long line of alcoholics, right? So I try to be really self-aware about habits because I know, you know, where those can go. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I caught myself doing this maybe the second or third time. I'm like, wait, why am I doing this gig? I, I literally hate playing in this band now because I don't like the lineup. I don't like the way this person plays. I don't have to do this. And so I talked to the person who was coordinating the band and told them, I said, yeah, this just isn't working for me. And, and I was polite about it. And it wasn't like a screw you kind of thing. And I explained specifically what my issue was without being, you know, uh, vicious about it or anything. It was just like, yeah, I just don't like playing with that person. I just don't like the way that person plays. And, and they were like, okay, no problem. And, and then as soon as that person stopped playing in the band, phone rang and they were like, uh, I, I, if, if I take what you said at face value, I assume you still want to play. And it was like, absolutely. Yes, please. And and then we played for several more years together. So uh, there are ways to handle that. But but yes, you can walk away if you don't like playing with the people for sure. In fact, I highly recommend it if 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 you can do it in a way that, you know, doesn't impact your your financial life uh, negatively or your family's life. I mean, it's it for me, it was not. The that particular gig was not the you know, the, the thing putting bread and butter on the table. So it was I had the 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 luxury of being able to walk away from it. So, yeah. Craziness, craziness. Uh, I don't know that we have time to talk to answer Tom's question. So I'm going to cue that up for our first episode of the new year, which will happen not next week, but it will happen on January 13th uh, because I've got to be at CES next week. And it's crazy to try and record while I'm doing that. So. Uh, so we will cue Tom's uh, democracy and song selection. That's not enough for a, an entire episode, though. So if you folks have anything that you would like us to discuss, please, please, please send it to us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We will uh, we, we get those emails and we will answer them and then we will factor them in and, and put together a nice little show for you on the 13th. However, we're not quite finished with this episode, are we, Mr. Kent? We're not, we have to offer our best intentions. You know, some people want to lose a lot of weight. Some people want to be a better human, want to give more to charity. What are our musical New Year's resolutions? Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, I have a couple in mind. I I thankfully had the benefit of all of about 42 minutes to think about this. So, uh, so. Uh, yeah, my, my first one will be, I will be polite, but, uh, intentionally clear about my, the, the gigs I'm willing to take when it comes to short money. So I will put my money where my mouth is, no pun intended with what we talked about in this episode. So that's definitely one of the things, maybe not the most important one on my list, but that, that'll be one. My first one is I am going to be much harder on myself and commit to getting my lyrics learned, not to get them 80% learned <clears throat> before a rehearsal and then often bounce along with 10% of the lyrics being either mumbled or substituted out until I learned them all. Even in the first couple of gigs that I do the show, just be a lot more diligent about getting those lyrics learned. That is, that's a good one for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Being off book mm. is key. For, yeah, I like it. Look, I, yeah. I like it. Yep. What else it you is. got? Um, I I need to figure out a way to get regular practice, not rehearsal. That's fine, but practice of my own to continue to improve my skill set to level up. Uh, I need to, I need to I need to add practice into my sort of daily schedule, and it's not there right now. Uh, and it may that may mean finding a teacher and taking some lessons to sort of force me down that path uh, mm. to, you know, because that that sort of creates that accountability uh, structure and also, you know, has the side benefit of, you know, someone else that I can learn from. So 
Yeah, I, I I want to do that. I I did some of it for a short period of time uh, this year, and I mean my my skill set. You know, even just three weeks of regular disciplined playing. It doesn't have to be eight hours a day. Although, I mean, that would be wonderful. I just I don't that kind of time I don't have, so that's unrealistic. But you know, an hour a day, even thirty minutes a day, my skill set definitely like moved up a notch doing that and and has stayed there i've been able to maintain it but i i want to keep moving forward i want to keep growing as a player so something that will get me to practicing more regularly and and it it might well mean spending a little money so that i'm i'm incentivized to make that money worthwhile yep good one yep i think that that, that's the musical equivalent of you know i want to lose weight this this year right It's, it's like the most obvious thing that you want to do to take care of your your chops, you know, your musical self. And so that's, that's a good one. Yeah. I'd say my second one is, is similar to our, um, I, our conversation a few minutes ago. I need to commit to doing at least six charity events this year. I did, I think one last year, huh. we, do, we usually do two or three. I want to make sure that I give back to music a little bit more. And I just want to set a little metric goal for myself. Six things would be um, what I'd like to do. And it doesn't have to be house rocker stuff or in community sure. guys could be my solo acoustic stuff or whatever, but I'd like to give back a little bit more this year and, um, and, you know, have some good karma flowing that, uh, that the privilege of being able to play music, part of that is being able to share the music with people who need it or where you can do some good for it. Not, I mean, I think you you do good all the time you play music, but I think if you can use that, that skill, you know, to help people raise money or make people feel better, you know, I would love to do a, um, a, um, a couple of, of, uh, hospital shows, Mm. uh, next, next holiday season. So I would like to do that. Yeah. That's number two for me. Oh, yep. that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I miss like when I was doing rock band club for those few years and coaching the kids at the high school and, and putting all that together with them and watching them grow. I mean, that was hugely rewarding and obviously not not in a financial way at all. But um, but yeah, yeah. Giving giving back in in any way that you can uh, is definitely and it. It you know, it also helped me improve my skills when you're teaching. You are you know, you learn a lot when you, when you sit down to teach somebody else, when you have to think about what it is you do. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know that I have any others more, more recording. Uh, that, that is a fling goal. We are really focusing more and more on originals and man, the, the, the songs have just been flowing. We've had a couple of really nice practices, uh, rehearsals, get togethers, um, to not only write songs, but really craft these into, you know, these song ideas into band songs. And so I want to, I want to get my recording set up here a little more streamlined so that it's, it's a little easier to just record a rehearsal and do multi-track and things like that. So sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I have all the, I have all the gear, I have everything I need. It's just not set up in a way that, that that's going to, that, that it works. And I want to fix that. So So I will meet you on that. And my third is going to be very similar is that, you know, for years I have talked myself out of exploring original material. I want to write three, three, at least write three completed, write and record three completed songs. Whoa. Oh yeah. That's yeah. That's, that's that I will, that's scary writing (laughs) songs. No, it totally is. I, I, um, I, I always joke that I've, I've written one song and it, did moderately well on college radio. And so I quit while I was ahead. Uh, And that is largely true. I've participated in the writing process and especially the arranging process for many, many other songs. But in terms of, you know, ideas that germinated for me and then were made into songs, really, it's just been one. So uh, I I need to uh, now, now I'm, now I'm, you know, sitting on the the fence of fear, right? Like, Oh, the next one could be bad. Well, I would assume the next one would be bad. I would assume the next 10 will be bad. So uh, I just got lucky the first time. And I had good songwriters around me that, that sort of shaped, helped shape that song into what it became. So I I can't, I certainly can't and don't take all the credit for it, but, um, but it is a nice little soundbite to say that I've only written one song and it did pretty well. You're batting a thousand. That's the problem with batting a thousand is there's only one way to go from there. Yeah, but 300 will put you in the hall of fame. So you've got a long way to fall. (laughs) That's true. That's true. So I could write 
two more songs and, and have them be awful and it doesn't matter. You're I'm still, still a Hall of Famer. Famer. That's, right. That's right. See, this is the perspective that I need. This is what keeps <laughs> me coming back every week. Thank you, my friend, and happy new year to you. you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Good happy stuff. New Year, my buddy. Happy we New have Year, a good, everybody. Yeah. We have a good run going here, you know. I think so. Yeah. We got we got three, three years of the podcast. I think we got, this what, is we're ending four year four, right? Isn't that right? Four years of the podcast. What about about eighteen years of friendship now? Uh, yeah. Holy cow, man. Yeah. Well, have fun, folks, and. uh always be performing. Happy New Year, everybody.